Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. My name is Jeff Adams. I'm one of the pastors here, in case you forgot, since I've been gone the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, the great thing about live streaming, and welcome to all of you, wherever you are, that are with us this morning right now uh, via Internet. Uh, but it's, it's really great that when I was in Europe the last uh, two and a half weeks or so, I've been able to keep up with our series in, in the book of Luke, chapter 17, and got to hear Jim Lee a couple of weeks ago and Stephen Ray last week. And so I feel like I've been a part of what has been going on, and today I'm pretty excited to be able to finish this series that we've called The Time Is Now. And we will be in Luke chapter 17, is where we're going to be this morning. And we've said that in this chapter, there's this sense of urgency on the part of Jesus in all that he is communicating uh, in Luke chapter 17. I want to talk about that, and specifically today, I want to talk about the time to be ready. And uh, let me just uh, pause for just a second, because uh, many of you know that for the last many, many years, I've taken a, a study group uh, to Europe every fall, first couple of weeks of November, and uh, we spend our time in Paris and Amsterdam. Yeah, we, uh, we were just in Paris just a few days ago, and... Uh, yeah, very familiar with every one of those sites. In fact, uh, I've walked by every one of those sites uh, and all within a very short walk of the hotel where we've stayed. And so very personal feel uh, that I have this morning for the things that uh, have just occurred in Paris. And I'm going to say more about that in just a second, but uh, we're, we're glad to be back. Uh, we went to Paris first. Actually, uh, uh, Cheryl and I and, and uh, another couple of the Uppermans, we went to Brittany uh, in western France a few days early, and uh, were able to work with one of our key contacts in France, Patrice Niveau, and uh, be able to do some training in his church and some of the leaders that he works with. And from there we went to Paris, spent uh, six days in Paris, and then on and spent seven days in Amsterdam, just coming back a couple of days ago. So all of this is just really, really kind of fresh in my mind. And so today I want to talk about the fact that it is time to be ready. The time is now to be ready. And, and what does that mean? Now, I don't want to start any marital wars, but does one of the marital partners in your situation get ready faster than the other? Now, let me, just, let me just confess right up. Cheryl gets ready much faster than I do. It's because she looks good already. She doesn't have much to do. Now, it takes me a long time to keep from causing kids to cry on the street when I walk by. And so, it, you know, I have to work at it more. So I'll, I'll just confess that right up front. But usually in every family, every relationship, not just a marital relationship, but, but undoubtedly you've got a friend or a co-worker or somebody in your family that has a reputation for always being just a little bit behind. You know what I mean? And surely that's not you, right? No, no, you would not be at the early service, you would be at the later service. So I'm speaking with confidence right now. But this whole concept of being ready is absolutely so important. Now let me give you, a, let me give you an example of, of what I think we're going to see this morning. Talk three weeks ago when we were entering into this series about first responders. We lost a couple of firefighters here in Kansas City. Very tragic thing that, that happened here. And we commented on that. We recognized our first responders. And I want you to think about first responders for just a second. Let's just, let's just take firefighters, okay? You can drive by a firehouse anywhere in Kansas City about any time of the day. And uh, we've got a good number of firefighters in our church. And one of the things that those people know how to do is to cook. They're big-time chefs, right? I'm seeing a lot of heads go up and down. And it, it's, it's really cool. If you, if you want good recipes, if you want to learn how to barbecue, become friends with a firefighter, okay? It's, it's just part of what happens. And, and so even though they can, sometimes I, I, I used to drop my shirts off at a dry cleaning establishment across from a supermarket, and it just so happens that every, every time during the week that I go in and drop my shirts off, it's, it's at the same time that this big fire pumper uh, pulls up in front of the grocery store, and, and the firefighters get out, and they, they go inside, and they're buying their supplies, and they come out with all these baskets of food. And so I know what I'm talking about, but you know what? they're ready. They are ready at a moment's notice. And when the alarm sounds, when you have a need, 
and they are ready to respond, whether it's a firefighter, whether it's a law enforcement officer, whether it's a, a medical personnel, wh whatever it may be, they are trained to be ready and they go. But it's not like they stand around all day like that. <laughs> Life goes on. And they learn how to be relaxed. They learn how to have a good time. They learn how to cook. They learn how to play games with each other, talk with each other, whatever. Life goes on. But they're ready. Now that is exactly what we're going to hear from the lips of Jesus today. And I want us to read this passage beginning in Luke chapter 17, verse 26. And, and then let me come back and make some comments on it. Luke chapter 17, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah... So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came, and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that, the Lord, that, that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed." In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wherever the body is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now part of that's pretty clear. In other parts of that you're like, Huh? What's he talking about? Let, let me take some time and explain this morning what Jesus is doing. Jesus is telling his disciples, and that includes us, how to live after his time, Jesus, on earth is over. He knows that he's on the way to Jerusalem. He knows that he's going to be crucified. He is ready for that. And now he wants his disciples to be ready for that. And he wants us to be ready. So here's, here's the basic thing that we're dealing with this morning. How can we, you and me, as followers of Jesus Christ, be ready for whatever life brings? How can we be ready? How should we live on earth as followers of Jesus Christ in light of current events? Now, one of the advantages of getting older, one of the few advantages of getting older, is the fact that you see how history tends to cycle. I came to faith in Christ as a university student many years ago, and during that time there was this incredible interest in biblical prophecy. The Israeli-Arab war had just happened, and everybody was finding everything that would happen in the news would find a Bible verse. And we just knew that Jesus was coming this year. One of my friends at church at that time, she, she refused to buy hardcover books because she thought it would be a waste. Jesus is coming soon, so why should I buy a hardcover book? Because it'll, I'll, I'll never have a chance to wear it out. Now, she's got a lot of books today that are probably looking kind of ratty, because that was a long time ago. At that time, there was a guy by the name of Hal Lindsey. He wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And I can remember reading that. I remember hearing his tapes and all this type of stuff. And we were certain that this world would not last another few years. And then we had another book come out. 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 1988. <laughs> you can get it cheap on eBay. Uh, unless it's some type of historical oddity. And, and then there was the Tim LaHaye and Left Behind series and all the movies and all the books and all this type of stuff and, and, and all the things that go on with that. And then do you remember when, when we hit the year 2000? Your refrigerator was going to blow up in your kitchen. All the computers in the world were going to shut down all together. Planes were going to drop from the air. And people literally, you know, would, would 
get caves and mountains and store food and supplies. Can you remember what it was like sitting in your living room with TV on and, and the, the clock ticking and, and you saw, okay, Australia's still there. They haven't fallen into the sea. That's good. That's good. They're the first ones. And, and we kind of watched that thing go all around the world and, 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 and here we are. And uh, wow. And, and then just recently the blood moon thing. Anybody get caught up in that? Oh my word. You know, this blood moon is going to, you know, and, and the blood of Jesus and blah, 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 you know, all, all this type of stuff. And so people are out planting gardens. They're back getting the caves in the side of mountains and, and putting supplies in. And you know what's unfortunate about that? Many times the people that do these things and get all caught up in them are people who believe the Bible. And here's the thing. Your neighbors, your family, your coworkers, they see that. And they think, okay, here we go again. And they love you, but they just kind of like, okay, something happened in the world. I'm going to hear about this. And so we've got all the new reasons. We've got all the new explanations. And it seems like life just goes on. Now, I believe that Jesus is coming again. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I think sometimes we get so carried away. And the problem is not that we believe the Bible. The problem is sometimes we don't understand what it says. We take it out of context or we become confused, or we try to read things into it. And in light of what happened in Paris on Friday, in, in light of what happened in Nigeria not that long ago, in light of what happened in Lebanon not that long ago, and remembering that just this year in January, the Charlie Hebdo uh, situation in, in Paris as well, by the way, in the same neighborhood, uh, how do we handle that? What should be our reaction? Fear? Uh, cancel your travel plans? Try to take some Bible verse and twist it around to try to make it fit to this or that? And make another prediction that Jesus has to return soon? Okay, can I just share something with you that I hear from people who don't share our faith from time to time? Sometimes we're so quick to share things that mean a lot to us. It's hard for people to understand that don't share our faith that Jesus is coming again. So something like this happens. And instead of saying, oh, wow, what a tragedy. What a tragedy to see what has happened in France, to see what has happened in Nigeria, to see what has happened in Lebanon. And some of you know that Jay and I were just in Nepal before the earthquake just a few days earlier this year. In fact, we have one of our Nepalese uh, pastor friends uh, uh, with us today. And um, we, we see those things, and sometimes our, our response is, well, just shows you Jesus is coming again. It can't be long now. I'm getting out of here. I understand what we mean by that. And I do believe that Jesus is coming again. But can I tell you what people often hear? Because in communication, the issue is not so much what we say, but what people hear. And what sometimes people hear is, we don't really care about people who are hurting and suffering. We don't really know how to cry with them and mourn with them. And that's why sometimes lost people say that the Christian faith is nothing more than naive escapism. And honestly... When we say things like that without thinking a lot, it causes people to look at us sometimes and think, you know what, either you're very naive and immature, or you just don't get it. People who are wanting to know, how do I deal with life now? Now, is it great to share our faith in the future? Absolutely. My, my point is, is, it's what Jim Lee was saying earlier, how do we communicate this? to people who have heard Bible-believing Christians for years now ratchet up every time something happens and make all these wild predictions that never come true, and they stop believing. They stop giving us credibility. And I think Jesus has some amazingly practical information for us here. What does he teach us in this passage today? A passage that communicates a sense of urgency and the need to be ready now. 
I find two main, two main messages here that I want to share with you. Number one, settle in for the long haul. And number two, be ready to move out on a moment's notice. Kind of like firefighters. Settle in for the long haul, but be ready to move out just like that. Let me talk to you about that. Settle in for the long haul. Sense of urgency that we see in this chapter. Jesus knows that his days are numbered. And, and he's ready. But as I said before, he wants his disciples to be ready. The Pharisees are asking him about the timing of the kingdom. And this is part of his answer, what we've just read. And from John's gospel, we know that Jesus has also promised his disciples that he's preparing a place for them. And that he will come again for them. And that's a very important part of our faith. We believe that Jesus is coming again. But both of these parties have one thing in common. They all think it's going to be soon. When they're thinking about the coming again of Jesus Christ, they all think that it has to be a matter of days or weeks at the latest, maybe a couple of months. They think it's going to be soon. I want you to look again in chapter 17, verse 20. Jim Lee took us through this a couple of weeks ago. Luke chapter 17 and verse 20, And when the Pharisees demanded of him when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God comes not with observation. Now that sounds a little stilted. Let me, let me paraphrase that and say it the way that we would say it in modern English. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Okay, now, hold on to that. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is coming in ways that cannot be observed. So what do I look for? The kingdom of God is coming in ways that cannot be observed. So when is it going to be? The kingdom of God is coming in ways that cannot be observed. So what this means is he's coming. No, the kingdom of God is coming in ways that cannot be observed. Let me say it one more time. The kingdom of God is coming in ways that cannot be observed. Hold on to that for a second. Now, it could come right now, before this service is over. It could be a hundred years from now. It could be a thousand years from now. But it is imminent. It could happen at any moment. And, And despite the sense of urgency and the need to be ready now, what Jesus is saying here, it is so important that we not disengage from normal life because he has put us here on mission. We're here for a purpose. We're here for a reason. And so what Jesus says here is that not much has changed from Noah's day or from Lot's day. So in verse 26, when he says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, so it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The point is this. Just like it happened in the days of Noah, just like it happened in the days of Lot, nobody knew the exact moment, but life went on. This is not some secret code as to what to look for so that we can know. Because Jesus said, the kingdom of God comes in ways that cannot be observed. But what Jesus is saying is, what were they doing in the days of Lot? Same thing that they're doing now. They got married. They raised families. They built businesses. They planted crops. They ate. They drank. What did they do in the days of Noah? Well, they got married. They they raised families. They built buildings and businesses. They, They planted crops. They ate. They drank. Life went on. Normal life will go. What Jesus is telling them and us, settle in for the long haul because you don't know. And you won't know. Oh, it's going to happen, but not in ways that can be observed. So life goes on. Settle in for the long haul. Well, Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And has there ever been a time in human history without wars and rumors of war? Well, look what's happening in Syria. Look what's happening in Lebanon. Look what's happening in Nigeria. Look what's happening in France. Yeah, and statistically, to be very honest with you, 
Historians tell us that we're living in kind of a lull right now in terms of war. There's less hard war going on in the world right now than there has been in quite some time. But here's what's different. We now know how to bring it into your cell phone 24-7. We now know how to bring it into your living room as you're eating dinner, as you're eating breakfast. We are on top of everything that's going on in the world. It makes it Has there ever been a time in history without wars and rumors of war? Of course not. What Jesus is saying is simply this. Life is going on. And even though this world is beautiful and you can see the hand of God's creation, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And we can see it in Lebanon, in Nigeria, in Paris, in Nepal, and on and on and on and on. Settling for the long haul. We're here for a reason. If you've been following along with me in this chronological, missional Bible reading we've been doing this year, uh, and, and every day I try to tweet something that occurs to my twisted mind as, as I read that passage each day. Yesterday, we, we were reading Matthew 28 and verse 10. I just stopped there. Jesus said in Matthew 28, not, uh, Jesus saying to the women that discovered him alive after his resurrection, he said, Be not afraid. Be not afraid. And then he told them to go and tell his disciples that they had seen him and to tell them to go into Galilee that he would meet them there. But he said, be not afraid. And I took that in light of what was going on in Paris and I thought, wow, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I don't have to live a life of fear. Now Jesus said, we will be persecuted. We will be misunderstood. We will suffer for his sake. And sometimes we suffer just because we're silly. But he said, if you follow me, it will cost you. But don't be afraid. So the correct reaction to what happens in places like Paris, and it'll be somewhere else, is not fear. It's it's not getting into our turtle shell and saying, Jesus is coming again, Jesus is coming again. It's understanding that we live in a twisted world. And even though we have a citizenship in heaven because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are here on mission. It's not about us. It's about the mission that Jesus Christ has given to us and using us to announce His love and His mercy and His grace, His transforming power to those who are hurting and in a time of need. And here's the second thing that I think we need to clearly, clearly understand. Number one, settle in for the long haul. Go on with life. If you've got a career, be the best that you can at it. If God has put you in a position of life, go for it. God's given you a family, raise them in the love of God. If God has given you this open door, go through it. Live out life. But the second lesson is this. Be ready to move out at a moment's notice. Be ready. Now, if you wait to get ready, it will probably be too late. And that's the point with both the generations of Noah and Lot. God was warning. God had given his truth, but people were not prepared. They were not ready. And and so when the time came, they weren't ready. What are you waiting for to get ready? Are you waiting to serve God? Are you waiting to be responsible? Are you waiting to get ready for Christ's coming? You you know, life is so weird. I'm reflecting a few days ago in Amsterdam what I'm going to be saying this morning, and I'm I'm kind of meditating on it. I'm running this passage through my mind. And I, I guess because I'm so dense that before I speak on something, God has to have me live that. And so I do all these stupid things in order for God to teach me. And so here I am in, in, in Amsterdam last week. We had a group of 17 people with us. And, and understand something. I've been going, I, I, Amsterdam has been a part of my life for almost 40 years. Okay, so I know Amsterdam pretty well. 
But we were staying in a, a different hotel this year, and, and uh, I, I'm, I can, Amsterdam's a very easy city to get lost in because it, from, there's this concentric circle of canals that springs outward, and every time you move, you're turning in a different direction, and you can get so twisted and lost. And people are amazed. They go to Amsterdam with me, and I'm just walking along like, okay, yeah, we're going to go here, we're going to go there. I've been doing this a long time. So here's the deal. We have a rule in our group. On time is five minutes early. Okay? And, and I say that because we have a lot of things to do. And so we always say on time is five minutes early. It, when 18 people are coming down at the same time in the hotel elevator, <laughs> sometimes you have to wait. And so I'll just plan on being there five minutes early and we're fine. So the other day, we're getting ready to go take this canal tour at night, which is breath taking for its beauty. It's incredible. One of my most favorite moments. And, and I'm like, yeah, I've done this all the time. And so guess who violates the five minute early rule? That would be me. I, I was hurting. Oh, oh, oh by the way, I, I need to tell you that some of you asked about my knee. Had arthroscopic surgery in June because I had a couple of meniscus tears. And it just, you know, sometimes I'm thinking, it's getting better, it's getting better. And then it's, no, no, it's not. And so, of course, I don't, it, it, I don't know if there's any connection that since then I've been like in Nepal and India and China and Japan and Taiwan and the Philippines and, and Egypt and all these different places. But so anyway, I, I get over to Europe this time. And my knee is killing me. And there were days when I just couldn't go any further. And I would just stop and say, I can't take another step. And I would tell the group, go on, go on. I had a couple of people with me who had been there before, like, go on. I'll catch up with you. I can't move. I was, I was miserable. And I'm thinking, i got to check my warranty on this surgery. So I get back, and by, by a miracle of God, the day after we get back, I get into my surgeon's office, and what they tell me was, you know, both comforting and like, really? They, they said, your problem is not the surgery, but we told you that sometimes the surgery has a way of accelerating the onset of arthritis, and since you already had arthritis in that knee, uh, you're one of a small group of people that sometimes when we do this surgery, your arthritis just goes crazy through the ceiling. I'm like, oh, great. So they said, but we'll give you this nifty little cortisone shot, and uh, you'll be fine. I'm like, really? <laughs> Look at me. I'm Superman. <laughs> now, a few days ago, I could not walk. So I, this is all background. So anyway, I, I come down to the hotel lobby. It's about one minute before we leave. And Natalia, my assistant, says, hey, they told us to be there 10 minutes early. And, Whoa, we'd better leave right now. So walk out the door, absentmindedly. We hop on the wrong tram. It's raining, okay? All right, give, give me some slack. So we get on the wrong tram. We, we go a stop or two, and I'm looking at Natalia going, this is bad. We're going in the wrong direction. So we get everybody off. Then we get back on the tram, heading the opposite direction. Go back to where we started. And I'm looking at my watch, and I'm going, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. So I, I tell the group, we're going to have to walk. It's raining. Okay, did I mention it's raining? So anyway, I'm leading them through all these back passages and alleys, and we're going along, and it, they're, they're struggling to keep up with this old man with a gimpy knee. And I'm going... I'm, I'm, it, it's the most ridiculous thing that you have ever seen. And I'm shouting at them, Come on, you can go faster! <laughs> it, was, it was nuts. We made it. But we, we finally got to the point where we're about two blocks away, and, and I told Natalia, Take them on, take them on, I can't go any further. Go, go, I'll try to catch up. We, we all made it. And, and here's one of the funniest things. One of the guys in our group, he came downstairs like one minute late, and he's like, Where'd everybody go? We were gone. Now he was texting us, but it's raining. I'm, I can't text him. I can't even read, you know? I'm, oh. and, and when I got done with this, I'm thinking, that's why you have to be ready. If I would have been ready, if I would have taken just one minute to review in my mind what we were going to do, I wouldn't have made that stupid mistake. If, if the guy who got there one minute late would have gotten there even on time, not five minutes early, he would have gone on the excursion. If you're not ready, it'll probably be too late. 
And this is what Jesus is saying. If you're not ready now, it'll probably be too late. Why are you waiting? Are you ready? When, when Christ returns, Jesus is saying here, you'll know it. Well, what should I look for? Don't worry. When, when I come, you'll know it. You, you, remember, you remember in the days of Lot? You remember all the fire and brimstone stuff? You think you could have missed that? I, I think you would observe that. If there's fire and brimstone falling from the sky, you're probably going to figure it out. You'll know it. Be ready. Be ready. Stop trying to figure it out when and how Christ is going to return. He will. And when he does, nobody will have to explain it to you. You'll know. Take his word for it, not mine. And then Jesus says this in verses 31 and 32. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house... Let him not come down to take it away, and he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. Keep a loose grip on anything in your hand except for your faith. Whatever you have, hold it loosely because you've got to be ready to move out. We've all heard it said that you can't take it with you, and that's surely true, but it also applies to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So let me ask us this morning, what is it that you or I might be holding on to that would keep us from experiencing all that God has for us and from being an effective part of his mission? Your kids, your career, relationships, things, money, fear, hurt. Those are just some things that come to my mind. That's obviously not a complete list. I'm asking, what is it in your life that you're holding on to so tightly that it blinds you from seeing what God is doing in the world around you and from what God wants to do specifically through your life? And then Jesus comes back, and, and, and well, he, he says here, he says, it is a very simple statement, three words, remember Lot's wife. What was the deal with her? She couldn't let it go. They're fleeing from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and she turns around. She could not turn it loose. Remember Lot's wife. What are you, what are you holding on to with that death grip? Death grip, so aptly named. What is it in your case? And, and then Jesus says in the very next verse, verse 33, Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. And by the way, that doesn't mean, that means two people, okay? It's translated as men in English, but in Greek it's very clear. If, if there's a couple in bed, don't read anything else into that, okay? I tell you, verse 34, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be left, shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Now this verse connects the story of Lot's wife with this that follows. And, and verses 34 to 36 are, are not in the context of what many have called the rapture. And, and no, I, yeah, I still believe in that, but... but that's not the context here. The context is the ultimate separation in judgment between those who are prepared and those who are not prepared. That's what Jesus is saying. This is not some secret Bible code. This is just the plain teaching of Jesus. Are you prepared? And what he's really saying here is this. If you really want to keep something, give it away. If you want to save your life, turn loose of it. Give it to Him. You really, you really want to hold on. Then if you want to keep it, give it to Him. That's the principle. Don't hold on to anything too tightly, but if you want to keep it, then give it to Him. If you want to keep it, give it away. What do you need to give away this morning? 
Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're just like, ah, oh, oh, oh. give it away. Just turn loose of it. It's eating you alive. You're filled with worry. You're filled with anxiety. It could cause you to be depressed. It could cause you to do stupid things. Just turn loose. Turn loose. Verse 37 is enigmatic. They answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wherever the body is, there will be eagles gathered together. What in the world does that mean? The disciples evidently want to know where these events will occur. And so rather than giving them a geographical location, Jesus tells them what to expect by quoting what is probably a common proverb of the day. And, and, and what he's simply saying is where, where dead bodies are, where corpses are, there will be birds of prey. There's where the eagle will be. By the way, the Greek word that is correctly translated as eagle is also correctly translated as vulture. It means bird of prey. And, and what he's simply saying here is, you want to know where? That's not the issue. What you need to know, it's going to be a scene of judgment. Now, some people see the eagle here as being emblematic of the Roman flag, the standard of, of Rome with an eagle on the top. Uh, maybe. But the, but the point is, that's why you need to be ready. There is no way to know everything that God has coming in the future. The kingdom of God is coming in ways that cannot be observed. But you can be ready. That's the point. So instead of getting caught up in every fad, in every current event, in every newsletter, in every post that somebody puts on Facebook, and instead of getting caught up in all of these things and, and saying things that maybe five years from now you're going to look back on and say, I really said that? Maybe it would be better to focus on being ready. Here's what we know for certain. Jesus is coming again. He promised he would. He said it, believe it. And when and all the other details he has told us are not ours to know. But why would you let one more day pass without making certain that you are ready for whatever the future brings? I mean, seriously. Friday night, two days ago in Paris, about a thousand people inside a pretty small concert hall not far from our hotel listening to an American rock band. Other people enjoying a beautiful Friday night, beautiful fall Friday evening, sitting in restaurants, a lot of them sitting in the street as is the custom in Paris. Even in the fall in Paris, the sidewalk cafes are open. They put these space heaters up above the, uh, the, the little canopy there and you, you can sit out even in the fall and, and just have a delightful meal. Others are filling a, a stadium, the, the Stade de France, that is the only place that's a little bit out of walking distance of our hotel. Others are just strolling down the street as, as people. That's why people love Paris. People don't have backyards in Paris. They, they have Paris. And, and they, they, they love to interact with people in the city of light. They love to just be out on the street and interacting and, and walking and, and, and all of that. Would you have been ready? You see, what happened in Paris is not an indictment against Paris because this could just as easily happen in the Power and Light District. It could have happened on a first Friday in the Crossroads District. It could have happened at the Plaza. It could happen at Arrowhead. And you know what? One of these days, it just might. And the issue is this, folks. Are you ready now. Do you know that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you know that your relationship with Him is alive and vital? Are you ready? Are you prepared? We can't control all those things. People say, oh, I'm so glad you made it back. Me too. Somebody told me this morning, I think you're part of a terrorist network. You're in Nepal, you leave, they have an earthquake. You're in Paris, you leave, they... Yeah, I know. We, we don't know what's going to happen. And this is Jesus' point. We don't know what's going to happen. So do not let fear control you. Go on with your normal life. 
But keep your eyes open and be prudent and be ready now. Just like the first responders. Don't get paralyzed. You don't know when the next call is coming in. Go on with the life, but be ready. Be ready now. Are you? And if you're not, I'd love to talk to you about it. Let's pray. Father, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the city of Paris today, Lord. As we have prayed for those in Nepal and Nigeria and Lebanon, so many other places around the world when we become aware of tragedy. God, I suppose this grips me more personally, having just been there, being able to visualize so clearly in my mind the places where these events took place. God, give wisdom to the leaders that you have established according to your truth. Lord, what, a, what an incredible balancing act. How can countries in the Western world, in Europe, and here in the United States and Canada, how can we properly respond to this amazing refugee crisis, people flooding out of Syria, flooding out of places like that, fearing for their lives? And, and Lord, please, how can we respond to danger and at the same time not be negligent in ministering to the many normal people who simply want to get on with life and who need to hear so many of them the good news of Jesus Christ. Remind us, Lord, that we are part of this mission. We don't live on an island. We're connected. You've given us a job to do. Lord, make us sensitive to our own city and to the people around us, and Lord, to our own lives, that we might be ready now. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So uh, before we dismiss, I want to remind you guys, if you are a guest, we would love the opportunity uh, for you to meet Jeff in uh, Guest Central. We also have our baptism class to the right. Volunteer opportunities are in the center there at the counter. Now, before you go, you're going to miss it if you walk out that door. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys are aware of this, and some people would say that I'm going to say this too quickly and too, uh, too soon, but it's almost Christmas. All right, is it too soon to say that? I waited until after Halloween. It's got to be something, right? <clears throat> all right. Uh, so Christmas is coming. All right. So next week, we're going to start a brand new series. That's tied into that. But I want to tell you something else about Christmas. We have a ton of events going on uh, at Graceway during the holiday season. So what we did is we created a website just to show all those things. We want you guys to be able to go there so you can see what's going on. We also want you to be able to share that with your friends and your family, your coworkers, because uh, maybe they'd like to come partake in some of what we're doing. And that, that website is christmasatgraceway.com. Okay, and on there is going to list all of our different events that are coming up. It's going to list our new uh, Christmas series that I'm about to tell you about. And it also has our worship team put together a Christmas album. All right? So uh, Jeremy and I were talking months ago, and we're like, wouldn't this be really, really cool uh, to put out a Graceway Christmas album? So uh, they have recorded five different tracks. Those are available to download from Christmas at Graceway.com. Okay? Or you can actually listen to them right on the site if you, uh, you're hesitant, you don't want to take up your valuable hard drive space until you're sure you like it. Uh, but I encourage you guys to download that. It's, it's great. It's a fantastic set of songs. Uh, I absolutely loved it. I've been listening to my office all week. My coworkers hate me because I'm playing Christmas music all week long. <laughs> but it's really great. Now, leading up to the final thing. Um, we start a brand new series next week called Surviving Christmas. All right? And we know that Christmas can be insane. Right? There is all the pressure of finding the perfect gift. There's the, the debt that seems to come with it in this country, okay? There's in-laws. I personally love my in-laws. Hi, hi mom-in-law. She, she watches online, so I have to be careful here. Um, <laughs> you're a fabulous mother-in-law. I love you. But some people don't like their mother-in-laws. Can you believe that? Um, <laughs> so that can be stressful, right? All the stuff that comes with Christmas. So we have a new series called Surviving Christmas because we want us to get back to what this season is really all about. In fact, we don't have to get stressed out and burned out by all that stuff. That in, in, in reality, 
we can celebrate this season as the birth of our Lord and Savior, all right? So as we leave today, I'm going to leave you with our uh, series trailer, all right? So you can get a little taste of what it's going to be like, and we will see you guys next week.